So we're here at the Arm TechCon 2016, and uh, so who are you? Hey, I'm Jan Fischer. I run our product marketing for uh, Arm and uh, other hyperscale architectures. And uh, you, you are John Masters. That's right. Last time I checked. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and you're going to do a keynote. I am going to do a keynote. Hopefully it's going to be a good keynote. Um, so I'm Chief Arm Architect at Red Hat. Um, and uh, see, we, uh, we have these fabulous banners this year. Uh, which Jan pays for with marketing dollars, which is amazing. And I plan to steal this banner right after we're done and take it home like I did with last year's banner. What did you do with last year's banner? It's uh, happily sitting in my bedroom at home and uh, people wonder, you know, why do you have a giant red hat banner? And um, I don't know, but I'll have two giant red hat banners Talking pretty soon. about drinking our own Kool-Aid. There we go, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect exactly yeah. And uh, it makes you uh, dream even bigger at night? Uh, maybe, 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 right? Yeah. So how long have you been... Uh, uh, promoting this vision that's happening right now with the ARM servers? Uh, so I've been working on ARM servers for about five years, and I was just uh, in a different interview, and I was saying that actually when we started this, we, uh, we realized that it was going to be you know, a five to ten year journey, right? So what we're seeing now, and I'm going to talk about in my keynote today to an extent, is we're starting to see some, some traction, but um, to, really, to really get moving with a new architecture. It, it's, it's a, it's a many-year journey. I would say at this point, where we are is um, we have a single operating system built in our development preview that runs on 10 different implementations of the architecture, right? So 10 different pieces of vendor silicon, right? Completely differently implemented, uh, all run the same unmodified OS. And then you can put those into dozens and dozens of different platforms. Right? So we are now at the point, I, part of me wishes we'd been here a while ago, but we are where we, where, we, uh, where we want to be in terms of the ability to run the same OS on many, many different vendors. And we are poised now, I would say, over the next 12 months to start to see a lot more adoption of ARM servers as some of the bigger players start to come to market, as we start to see the big OEMs taking a lot more interest in the enterprise space. So you envision uh, uh, this ARM servers market to be uh, potentially very, very big, right? and you're playing a big role in there. We're absolutely trying to stay in, in alignment with uh, what our customers are asking us to do. And we have had people asking for ARM uh, by name. Uh, they have strategies for alternative architectures. They have uh, been interested in exploring more of um, ARM designs, and we are supporting them in their desire to uh, have heterogeneous uh, data center infrastructure. As well as you know, with uh, with our development preview, we keep adding features. Um, we enabling um, major technologies like virtualization. We're looking into uh, providing newer tools with um, our operating system, while it's still staying in development preview. So Arm was saying last year they were saying 2020. Yeah. Uh, how many percent? 20 percent? They said 20 percent. 20 percent, right? It could even be higher. Yeah. Yeah. Could be higher. Yeah. So what's the, what's the click that's going to happen that suddenly everybody's using well, ARM servers? I would say there's three things happening. I would say the first thing is um, if you look at where the growth is in the market, you've got a lot of emerging players in Asia right now in APAC um, that are looking for an alternative architecture. And some of it's driven by government mandates and so on. Um, they're looking to say, um, I want to have an alternative. I'm, I'm very in favor of choice. This is, this is their view. And, uh, and so they are driving a lot of interest in, in the growth of ARM. Number two, you've got the hyperscalers in the US and elsewhere, the big guys that say, you know what, um, if I can save 20 or 30 percent in my OPEX or my CAPEX, then I'll take a serious look at this. Yes, it's energy efficient, but I'm willing to, uh, to, to, to have the, uh, the, the benefits I can get from having uh, alternative suppliers. Um, and then when you look at kind of the, the way that the industry is going, the way that the different technologies are going, you know, we've, we've kind of run out of the, 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 the cheap process innovations we've seen, right? So, you know, we went from, you know, 90 nanometer down to 65 nanometer down to, you know, um, the last couple of years we've been down at kind of the, the 28, 22, we're at the uh, 14 FinFET kind of stage now, but it's getting much, much harder to uh, pack those transistors more tightly um, and there are certain inherent limits that are coming in the next couple of years. And so nobody has a magic wand that can uh, <laughs> magically make the laws of physics go away. And so what that means is there's an opportunity here for ARM to say, okay, well, the other guys 
are not just going to get a faster chip every year. There's an opportunity here to come in with an alternative and be successful. And so the other thing that's happening in, in, in hand in hand with this is a transition towards using workload acceleration. Uh, so we've seen a lot of involvement uh, within Red Hat in terms of um, uh, working with the work groups that are building out uh, coherent interconnects, uh, new memory fabrics, new frameworks for interfacing with workload acceleration. Uh, so all these pieces are going to come together. It's not one thing. It's going to be um, the changing workloads, the ability for ARM to come in and disrupt the existing model because Moore's law is basically dead, let's be honest about it. Um, you've got a lot of interest from the hyperscalers to see alternative choices, and you've got kind of a Chinese government mandate to go and do something different as well. And uh, the chip makers in there, uh, like uh, Applied Micro and uh, uh, Kavium, yeah. they had kind of first, second generation chips. Yeah. <laughs> where they, it's, it's a long process to make a chip, and now they're getting to, let's say, XGene 3 and uh, Thunder X2 is pretty cool, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. It's one of these things where uh, the first generation is, is uh, I, w I, don't, I don't like to call them pipe cleaners exactly, but um, you know, you never kind of get your moon landing with the first generation, because you go and do a first generation in order to get people's interest. They start looking at these things and start saying, okay, well, maybe this will be credible when I get to the next one. But what they want to see is they want to see a pipeline. They want to say, there's a roadmap, there's a future. So I'm going to pick this vendor and I'm going to say, okay, this vendor has a roadmap. The reason that these guys announce generation two when they're in gen one is they want the others to say, oh, okay, if I choose this, there's a future for me, right? And the reason that we as a company have been doing these development preview releases, um, several of them now, is we want people to see that we are interested in this for the long term. So we're not yet releasing a supported product. And the reason for that is that we're waiting for you know, some of the big tier ones to come along. We're waiting for some of the uh, traditional kind of enterprise uh, market pieces to come together before we can get into that space. But we're ready to go when the customers um, are asking for us to, 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 to go there. And they're starting to ask for this now, and we're starting to get there. But you know, where, what people want to hear from us and from other Linux vendors and non-Linux vendors is that they have a roadmap and a future, and we do, and we're working on this, and the same thing for the silicon guys. So uh, as soon as, uh, I guess, as American companies, let's say, when they see the mathematics and they can see they can save some money, yeah. they're just gonna, they're gonna do it, right? They're not gonna avoid saving millions of dollars every year and they're on their I think money server talks. parks. I think money talks. I think, though, that you know, it, it, it's not an instantaneous saving. It takes time to deploy a new architecture, and that's why it hasn't happened instantaneously. Um, that's why we've been doing this for five years. But because we've been doing it for five years, we are now at the point where if somebody comes along with a credible offering, and they have, and they are, um, and people do the numbers and say, okay, I'm going to save millions of dollars by, by using that, um, then it's going to drive competition in a good way. And by the way, we don't prefer any one architecture vendor. Now, I personally am a big ARM um, fanboy. I think people know that. But um, we also have people that are you know, big fans of other architectures inside Red Hat. And Red Hat is a very neutral company. Yeah, right? since we're rooted in uh, open source, um, we technically don't prefer not just any specific chip maker or any specific um, architecture. We want to build from a common core that is upstream. And we want to apply it across different architectures, um, across the board, across the variety of the systems that exist, and, and the more systems that we can support with a single, um, um, single, singular operating system, single uh, distribution, if you will, the better it is for the market, the better it is for customers, the better it is for upstream. So Red Hat is one of the, uh, let's say, big successful Linux companies, right? We uh, are the biggest successful Linux company, if you yeah. will. Yes, yeah. We have to admit to that. So, yeah, I think that's a true statement. So uh, the way the way that it works uh, at Red Hat is uh, companies come and say, "Hey, can you help us?" And then you help them to make it real. How does it work? So we started a partner early access program um, about three years ago. That's what actually was the foundation of us building the uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Server for ARM and the, the one that we have in the development preview right now. We are. Co cooperating, we have been working with the silicon vendors, was actually with ARM directly, and also our OEMs and ODMs in designing uh, the operating system that runs across a variety of uh, their designs and, and their implementations of the uh, ARM V8 um, architecture. And at uh, Linaro, lots of stuff's been happening over the last years. And, That's right. Uh, it's, it's a cool bunch of guys, right? 
It is. It's, it's fun to work. It, it is. We, we actually just renewed our membership in the Lenaro Enterprise Group, which is uh, a, a collaboration between all these different companies to accelerate ARM in the enterprase. We also doubled and, down and, yeah. went, and went into uh, Lenaro Enterprise IoT Group, uh, Light. So because, now, uh, yeah. uh, did you see the keynote? Uh, yes. When Masayoshi San said one trillion uh, uh, ARM CPUs? Yes. One trillion IoT devices, right? So, they so need servers. <laughs> they do, they need gateways. So the thing that we're very, very uh, bullish on is ARM um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, telco infrastructure, so NFV. I was right. speaking at TechCon here about OPNFV, the Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization. It's a tongue twister. There's a lot of acronyms and buzzwords in NFV, and I tried to explain what they all are and kind of how, how we're working with ARM um, and Lenaro and other groups like OPNFV Project, as part of Linux Foundation, to accelerate those pieces. So we need the, the telco story, the, 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 the CSP, the Communication Service Provider, or story that they can deploy NFV infrastructure, right. which also expands to the edge, right? Yes. To the gateways that are near the customer. Because in 5G networks, you know, there's so much data moving around, you can't just centralize it all kind and of in a back office. The next wave of IoT will most likely be running right over that 5G networks, and, yes. and therefore there is a direct connection between what's, got, what's happening in the telco world and in the entire rehaul of the infrastructure and what's happening uh, in the IoT world. And that's why there is a very strong connection, and Masasan definitely see, sees it in the right way. It is an explosion of sorts. I don't know if it's Cambrian explosion, yeah, right, right. but it certainly is an explosion. And we, we also there, I mean, the unique position that we are in, uh, I think from our perspective, from yeah. Red Hat, is that we can bring some order to um, you know, the, the, the existing ecosystems that may have not been uh, standardized, may have not been looked upon as in, in need of standardization. Yeah. We're doing it very well in the enterprise world. Even in, using a Lenaro example, we brought, um, you know, uh, some order into leg, so to speak. Uh, we brought our designs uh, together, help with um, specification and standards. And I think we can have the same influence well, in IoT, and that's, that's our goal. We, mm -hmm. we would probably look at um, you know, gateways and up in terms of that ecosystem, but it certainly is in need of um, having some standards set. And let me use an to, example, To right? help everyone, yes, Yeah, let me please. use an example yeah. from last week. So last Friday, we had a, in the US, we had a, a particular, we had a major outage of a lot of uh, different companies that provide services to, yeah, to people, service, right? Yeah. It was a d distributed denial of service attack, right, DDoS attack. And it was done against DNS infrastructure that, that was uh, being used by these services to resolve you know, their, their names on the internet. But the way it happened was um, by exploiting uh, insecure uh, and openly accessible IoT devices and embedded devices that right. people had in their homes. And which there are billions and, of. And yeah, billions or, now. And yeah, now imagine, right, every light bulb, if every light bulb has an IP address, <laughs> right, and every light bulb becomes a, 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 bulb a target. Every light bulb has an opinion about giving light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have a problem <laughs> We have here. a problem, right? <laughs> so, 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 so what we need to do, the reason why, one reason that I think we, we can really help as a company is that we believe in standardization and we believe in having, uh, you know, industry standard platforms so that if you're building a gateway, that's going to provide the secure interface to a lot of devices over time. What you want to do is, you, you don't want to build this as kind of a hacked up embedded thing that has no future and no security updates and some custom board support package running on it and all this stuff. What you want is to have a standard platform on which you can run standard software. If you don't like our software, our software is great, but if you don't like our software, then run somebody else's software. But let's have a standard platform so you can get security updates and you can handle this over time because you're going to deploy this infrastructure and it's going to live for decades. And, uh, and that does not scale if you are saying, here's my kind of hacked up custom embedded solution that I built last week in my garage. That isn't going to scale for 10 years or 20 years of support. And you have a role to play to help uh, these IoT guys build more secure IoT devices. Absolutely. Well, if we apply the same um, good practices that we have done for years on, in, in terms of sanitizing, cleansing the code, and actually applying best practices of, of security um, uh, kind of you know, approaches, so secure approaches to code handling, I think they would benefit from that. I also want to lean on uh, the example from today's keynote um, about hacking the chips yes. and how Chrysler is unable to fix the problem without having to recall all these um, vehicles physically. So having a call home or call for helpline is very important. That's part of what uh, embedded system may not, um, ecosystem may not know or understand. And we're trying to say, 
give the, yourself a way out of it. Yes. By sticking to standards, you guarantee that it's not going to be hackable. You have a future and you have secure updates, secure right. provisioning, you have all the things that we know how to do in enterprise. It's different, but there is, uh, there's a lot of commonality in terms of the, uh, the, the, the concepts. Right. Cool, so looking right. forward to your keynote. Thank you very right. much. Thank you so yeah. much. Good talking with yeah. you. Likewise. Right.